Betjeman's Cornwall. Summoned by bells. Come, hygiene, goddess of the growing boy, I here salute thee in sanatogen. Anemic girls need viral, but for me, be Scots emulsion, rusks and melons food, cod liver oil and malt, and for my neck, rites, coal tar soap, euthymol for my teeth. Come, friends of hygiene, electricity and those young twins, free thought and clean fresh air. Attend the long express from Waterloo that takes us down to Cornwall. Tea time shows the small fields waiting, every blackthorn hedge straining inland before the southwest gale. The emptying train, wind in the ventilators, puffs out of Eglos Skerry to Tresmere through minty meadows, under bearded trees and hills upon whose sides the clinging farms hold Bible Christians. Can it really be that this same carriage came from Waterloo? On Wadebridge Station, what a breath of sea scented the Camel Valley. Cornish air, soft Cornish rains, and silence after steam. As out of Derry's stable came the break to drag us up those long familiar hills, past haunted woods and oil-lit farms, and on to far to Bethrick by the sounding sea. Oh, what a host of questions in me rose. Were spring tides here or neap? And who was down? Had Mr. Rosevere built himself a house? Was there another wreck upon Doom Bar? The carriage lamps lit up the pennywort and fennel in the hedges of the lane. Huge slugs were crawling over slabs of slate. Then, safe in bed, I watched the long-legged fly with red transparent body tap the walls and fizzle in the candle flame and drag its poisonous-looking abdomen away to somewhere out of sight and out of mind, while through the open window came the roar of full Atlantic rollers on the beach. Then before breakfast, down toward the sea, I ran alone, monarch of miles of sand, its shining stretches satin smooth and veined. I felt beneath bare feet the lugworm casts, and walked where only gulls and oyster catchers had stepped before me to the water's edge. The morning tide flowed in to welcome me, the fan-shaped scallop shells, the backs of crabs, the bits of driftwood worn to reptile shapes, the heaps of bladder rack the tide had left, which, lifted up, sent sand hoppers to leap in hundreds round me, answered, Welcome back. Along the links and under cold Bray Hill, fresh water pattered from an iris marsh and drowned the golf balls on its stealthy way over the slates in which the elvers hid and spread across the beach. I used to stand a speculative water engineer, here I would plan a dam and there a sluice, and thus divert the stream, creating lakes, a chain of locks descending to the sea. Inland I saw, above the tamarisks, from various villas, morning breakfast smoke, which warned me then of mine, so up the lane I wandered home contented, full of plans, pulling a length of pink convolvulus, whose blossoms, almost as I picked them, died. Bright as the morning sea those early days, though there were tears and sand thrown in my eyes, and punishments and smells of Mackintosh, long barefoot climbs to fetch the morning milk, terrors from hissing geese and angry shouts, slammed doors and waitings and a sense of dread, still warm as shallow sea pools in the sun, and welcoming to me the girls and boys. Wet rocks on which our bathing dresses dried, small coves, deserted in our later years for more adventurous inlets down the coast. Paralysis when climbing up the cliff, too steep to reach the top, too far to fall, tumbling to death in seething surf below, a ledge just wide enough to lodge one's foot, a sea pink clump the only thing to clutch, cold wave-worn slate so mercilessly smooth, and no one near, and evening coming on, till Rafe arrived. Now put your left foot here, give us your hand and back across the years I swing to safety with old friends again. Small seem they now, those once tremendous cliffs, diminished now those joy-enclosing bays. Sweet were the afternoons of treasure hunts. We searched in pairs and lifted after showers the diamond-sparkling sprays of tamarisk. Their pendant raindrops would release themselves and soak our shirt sleeves. Then upon the links, under a tea box, lay a baffling clue. 
a foursome puffing past the sunlit hedge with rattling golf bags, all the singing grass busy with crickets and blue butterflies, the burnet moths, the unresponsive sheep seemed maddeningly indifferent to our plight. Childhood is measured out by sounds and smells and sights before the dark of reason grows. Ears, hear again the wild sou'westers whine. Three days on end would the September gale slam at our bungalows, three days on end rattling cheap doors and making tempers short. It mattered not, for then enormous waves, house high, rolled thunderous on green away, flinging up spume and shingle to the cliffs. Unmoved amid the foam, the cormorant watched from its peak. In all the roar and swirl, the still and small things gained significance. Somehow the freckled cowry would survive, and prawns hang waiting in their watery woods. Deep in the noise there was a core of peace. Deep in my heart, a warm security. Nose. Smell again the early morning smells congealing bacon and my father's pipe, the after-breakfast freshness out of doors where sun had dried the heavy dew and freed acres of time to scent the links and lawns, the rotten apples on our shady path where blowflies settled upon squashy heaps, intent and gorging, at the garden gate reek of solignum on the wooden fence, mint round the spring and fennel in the lane, and honeysuckle wafted from the hedge, the linum cesspool like a body blow. Then clean, medicinal and cold, the sea. Breathe in the ozone, John, it's iodine. But which is iodine and which is drains? Salt and hot sun on rubber water wings, home to the luncheon smell of Irish stew and washing up stench from the kitchen sink because the sump is blocked. The afternoons brought coconut smell of gorse. At Mabley's farm, sweet scent of drying cow dung, then the moist exhaling of the earth in Schiller woods, first earth encountered after days of sand. Evening brought back the gummy smell of toys and fishy stink of glue and stickfast paste and sleep inside the laundriness of sheets. Eyes. See again the rock face in the lane, years before tarmac and the motor car. Across the estuary stepper point stand, still unquarried, black against the sun. On its Atlantic face, the cliffs fall sheer. Look down into the weed world of the lawn. The devil's coach horse beetle hurries through, lifting its tail up as I bar the way to further flowery jungles. See once more the Padstow ferry, worked by oar and sail. Her outboard engine always going wrong. Ascend the slippery keys, upended slate, the seaweed hanging from the harbour wall. Hot was the pavement under as I gazed at lanterns, brass, rope and ship's compasses in the marine store window on the quay. The shoe shop in the square was cool and dark. The Mrs. Quintrell fancy stationers had most to show me. Dialect tales in verse published in Truro, Netherton and Worth and model lighthouses of Serpentine. Climb the steep hill to where that belt of elm circles the town and church tower reached by lanes whose ferny ramparts shelter toad flax flowers and periwinkles. See hydrangeas bloom in warm back gardens full of fuchsia bells. To the returning ferry soon draws near our own low bank of sand dunes, then the walk over a mile of quicksand, evening cold. It all is there. Excitement for the eyes. Imagined ghosts on unfrequented roads, gated and winding up through broom and gorse out of the parish onto who knows where. What pleasure as the oil lamp sparkled gold on cut glass tumblers and the flip of cards to feel protected from the night outside. Safe Cornish holidays before the storm. I'm free, I'm free. The open air was warm and heavy with the scent of flowering mint and beetles waved on bending leagues of grass, and all the baking countryside was kind. Dear lanes of Cornwall, with a one-inch map, a bicycle and well-worn little guide, those were the years I used to ride for miles to far-off churches. One of them that year so worked on me that if my life was changed, I owe it to St. Irvin and his priest 
in their small hollow deep in sycamores. The time was tea time, calm, freewheeling time, when from slashed treetops in the coom below I heard a bell note floating to the sun. It gave significance to lichen stone and large red admirals with outspread wings basking on Budlia. So coasting down in the cool shade of interlacing boughs, I found St Irvine's partly ruined church. Its bearded rector, holding in one hand a gong stick, in the other hand a book, struck while he read a heavy sounding bell, hung from an elm bough by the churchyard gate. Better come in, it's time for evensong. There wasn't much to see. There wasn't much the little guide could say about the church. Holy and small and heavily restored, it held me for the length of evensong, said rapidly among discoloured walls, impatient of my diffident response. Better come in and have a cup of tea. The rectory was large, uncarpeted. Books and oil lamps and papers were about. The study's pale green walls were mapped with damp. The pitch pine doors and window frames were cracked. Loose, noisy tiles along the passages led to a waste of barely furnished rooms. Clearly the rector lived here all alone. He talked of poetry and Cornish saints. He kept an apiary and a cow. He asked me which church service I liked best. I told him Evensong. And I suppose you think religion's mostly singing hymns and feeling warm and comfortable inside. And he was right. Most certainly I did. Borrow this book and come to tea again. With Arthur Macken's secret glory stuffed into my blazer pocket, up the hill onto St Merrin, down to Padstow Quay, in time for the last ferry back to Rock, I bicycled and found Trebethrick a worldly contrast with my afternoon. I would not care to read that book again. It so exactly mingled with the mood of those impressionable years that now I might be disillusioned. There were laughs at public schools, at chapel services, at masters who were still big boys at heart. While all the time the author's hero knew a secret glory in the hills of Wales. Caverns of light revealed the holy grail, exhaling gold upon the mountain tops. At holy, holy, holy in the mass, King Brickens' sainted children crowded round, and past and present were enwrapped in one. In quest of mystical experience, I knelt in darkness at St. Enadoc. I visited our local holy well, where to the native Cornish still resort for cures for whooping cough and drop bent pins into its peaty water. Not a sign. No mystical experience was vouchsafed. The maiden hair just trembled in the wind, and everything looked as it always looked. But somewhere, somewhere underneath the dunes, Somewhere among the cairns or in the caves, the Celtic saints would come to me, the ledge of time we walk on, like a thin cliff path high in the mist, would show the precipice. One Man's County The visitors have come to Cornwall. The visitors, foreigners, we're called by the Cornish. I'm a visitor. We live to the cliffs with our houses. We live to the cliffs with our shacks. When I was a boy, all this place was open fields. And Cornwall is older than the Cornish. Come down to the sea's edge and watch the Atlantic and hear the words of the Cornish poet Hawker. They come, they mount, they charge in vain. Thus far, incalculable main. No more thy hosts have not o'erthrown the lichen on the barrier stone. Have the rocks faith that thus they stand, unmoved, a grim and stately band? Have the proud billows thought on life to feel the glory of the strife? Hear how their din of madness raves the battled army of the waves. Thy way, O God, is in the sea, thy paths where awful waters be. Thy spirit thrills the conscious stone. O Lord, thy footsteps are not known. How many million years ago what volcanic eruptions of the Earth's surface happened to twist these cliffs into those contorted shapes? The bones and undercrust of Cornwall are so old 
that the grass and trees and buildings on its surface seem trivial by comparison. For instance, I used to be told, I expect wrongly when I was young, that the white streaks you see in the slate were compressed oceans, fish and sand. If you come up onto the moors, you can see what the surface of Cornwall looked like before man came to live on it. Gigantic granite boulders are strewn about the highest places. Right on the top, they're piled on top of one another, like, for example, the cheese ring at Liscard. Now, people think that man made that monument. Wrong. Nature did it. Centuries of wind and rain have worn away the surrounding earth and made it smooth. When trees have dared to grow above the valleys, those same centuries of southwest winds have hammered them down and bent them inward, leaning from the sea. The Cornish moors are spotted with granite boulders, and the granite boulders are spotted with many-coloured lichens. The granite boulders moulder, they decompose, and make a thin soil. Out of the soil grow primeval-looking shrubs, their branches hung with silvery beards of lichen. To these high moors came early man to Cornwall. On view-commanding hills he built earth enclosures to protect his tribe and herds of cattle. From here he could watch out for the enemy, wild animals from thick woods below, or human enemies. The Danes and Saxons turned these camps into forts for subduing the Celtic Cornish, as here at Warpstow. Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. The Cornish moors were full of people. Their ghosts are there today. Ghosts of prehistoric fields here on the Land's End Peninsula. A race of giants must have built the hedges of those little enclosures. Late Bronze Age man, in about 2000 BC, first streamed the Cornish moors for tin and copper ore, and sold it to the ancient Greeks. Surface tin streaming works survive on the moors. The Cornish moors are full of ghosts, ghosts of forgotten worship in those stone circles of the Iron Age pagans. And earlier than that, in the Stone Age, there were the quoits of Cornwall. They were the tombs of Stone Age men, and covered over once with a mound of earth. What was this early religion about? At Menantol, on the Land's End Peninsula, the shapes of the stones suggest fertility worship. Then came the Christian missionaries from Wales to Cornwall, four centuries after Christ, and carved their crosses on pagan standing stones. They blessed the wells and lived in beehive huts beside pools and streams. They stood waist-high in the fresh running water by their cells and recited the Psalter. St. Petroc, St. Andelion, St. Minva, St. Tudy, St. Teth, St. Enadoc. They floated over on millstones and cabbage leaves from Wales and Ireland. But really, I think in coracles. They used the brown moorland water for baptising Iron Age pagans. They made Cornwall Christian, even before St. Augustine brought the Gospel to Kent. They were a band of holy hermits, monks and nuns of the ancient Celtic church, and about them all sorts of legends have grown. In these gentler times, so near to Christ, men moved down from the moorland into the wooded valleys. They ground corn by water power, and they made clearings in the thick woods for farming. Where fresh water meets the sea, and it's always running to meet the sea from the high land down to the coast of Cornwall, all round the coast the Cornish settled at the sea's edge, in places where they could get away from the wind, and they fished, as here at Boscastle. Snug, slate houses tucked into the side of the hill, looking down onto each other's roofs, looking up into each other's gardens. The Cornish have always been a religious people. Almost every Cornish church was rebuilt in the 16th century on the site of the cell of the Celtic saint who'd founded it a thousand years before and rebuilt in splendid style of that hardest and most intractable material, granite. Look at it close to see how it weathers. Look at it in a quarry on Bodmin Moor and see how hard it is to work, even today. Watch how they split it. That man down there is drilling holes. Then the staples are driven in and hammered, 
And now wait. At last. All that. To get a single slab. And after this, the surface has to be smooth and squared. Remember all the effort when you look at the hard surface of granite. Remember how hard it is to make the slightest impression. And after you've been watching that, look at the miracle of Cornish carving. The outside walls of St Mary Magdalene's Church, Launceston, carved out of moorland granite in 1511 and finished in 1524. John Wesley inspired the Cornish in Georgian times, rather as the Celtic saints had inspired them a thousand years before. What shoutings of glory must have been heard from those windows. What soul-converting sermons and full-throated hallelujahs must have sounded from here. No Cornish settlement seems complete without its Methodist or Bible Christian chapel for the humbler people. Cornwall was never a place of really big landowners. Most of the landowners were small squires, royalists in the Civil War, or recusants like the Ross Carracks, who lived here and suffered for their faith. They had granite and slate manor houses hidden in wooded valleys. They farmed the hills around. And many of these old Cornish manor houses have reverted to farms again. That slate piggery at Ross Carrick was built when Shakespeare was alive. And it is as good today as it was then. Slate. That's the other chief building material of Cornwall. Slate, which flakes and splits and keeps the weather out. You see it all over the houses, pale blue and silvery when it's old, and designed into patterns and graded into shapes. Slate. You can tell where you are in Cornwall from the colour of the local slate. Nearly every parish used to have its own quarry, except in the granite districts. Now they're all disused, except Delabole there, the biggest one which has been going on since the reign of King Stephen. Slate. The memorial headstones of Cornish churchyards are worth a film to themselves. Memorials. The fine, flourishy, engraved slate of Georgian headstones in Cornish churchyards are one sort. There's another sort of memorial, and they are the granite chimney stacks and slate chimney stacks in the churchyards of the Cornish tin and copper industry. These chimneys are memorials to the Cornish engineers, men like Trevithick and Hornblower, who in the 18th century improved on stationary steam engines for pumping up water out of the wet mines. Water was always the trouble with tin mining and hauling up minerals from a thousand feet below. For all its empty open look, this desolate country is dangerous to walk on. Underneath, it is a honeycomb of hundreds of miles of passages in the hot granite. Some shafts go down 2,000 feet. One false step, and you might find yourself plunged into black, hot silence. A silence always hangs about St. Day. It was once one of the chief mining towns of Cornwall. These streets were once like Oxford Street, a century and more ago, to ill-paid tin miners. After long hours in the hot, wet granite passages below the earth, they'd look into these shop windows, they and their poor families, gazing and gazing and longing to buy. For all its melancholy, St. Day is now the least spoiled town in Cornwall. Brunel's great railway bridge and viaduct linked Cornwall with England, and as the Great Western flourished, so did Cornwall's newer industry, derived from tin mining, the industry of China clay. The clay itself comes from decaying granite and is used for pottery, paper, face powder, dozens of things, and exported all over the world. The white silica waste, when the clay has been extracted, is lifted up onto tips and makes this lunar landscape of mountains round St Austell. Nothing will grow on these white tips. Unless there's an earthquake, those conical pyramids seen from all over Cornwall will continue to turn pink in the sunset and reflect the clouds. The white waste will continue to pollute brown streams and plunge on 
to streak the southern estuaries with creamy mud. It's hard to say whether the china clay industry or the tourist trade, we visitors, have done more harm to the natural beauty of Cornwall. You can't blame us for coming to Cornwall. These are Perrin Sands near Newquay. We have become nomads again, like prehistoric man. St. Piran brought the gospel and built his oratory in about 800 AD, and the oratory is still there, somewhere, hidden among the dunes and shacks. Here, where St. Piran brought the gospel, we, the new nomads, bring our caravans and our signs of what we call civilization. That's to say, transistor sets and sanitation for ladies. Civilization? Or barbarism? Does it much matter? When you think of the age of Cornwall and compare it with the very short time of recorded history and the still shorter time since man has started messing about with its surface, what is it? An eternity is no time at all. It's like that boy's sandcastle. The sea wastes all. Old friends. The sky widens to Cornwall. A sense of sea hangs in the lichenous branches and still there's light. The road from its tunnel of blackthorn rises free to a final height. And over the west is glowing a mackerel sky whose opal fleece has faded to purple pink. In this hour of the late lit listening evening, why do my spirits sink? The tide is high and a sleepy Atlantic sends exploring ripple on ripple down Polzeth shore and the gathering dark is full of the thought of friends I shall see no more. Where is Anne Channel, who loved this place the best, with her tense blue eyes and her shopping bag falling apart, and her racy gossip and 1920 zest, and that warmth of heart? Where's Roland, easing his most unwieldy car with its load of golf clubs backwards into the lane? Where Kathleen Stokes with her celiums. There's Doom Bar. Bray Hill shows plain. For this is the turn, and the well-known trees draw near. On the road their pattern in moonlight fades and swells. As the engine stops, from two miles off I hear St. Minver bells. What a host of stars in a wideness still and deep. What a host of souls, as a motorbike winds away and the silver snake of the estuary curls to sleep in Damer Bay. Are they one with the Celtic saints and the years between? Can they see the moonlit pools where ribbon weed drifts? As I reach our hill, I am part of a sea unseen. The oppression lifts. Cornwall. When I first came to Cornwall over 50 years ago as a small boy, we drove the seven miles from the station in a horse brake. There was only one motor car in the parish, and this could not attempt the steeper hills. Roads were only partially metalled, and in the lesser lanes the rock showed through on the surface. Everyone in the village had oil lamps and candles. A journey to the nearest town and back was a day's expedition. There were still many country people who had never been to London. And the story used to be told of one of them who thought the metropolis was all under a glass roof because he never got further than Paddington Station. Visitors to Cornwall, foreigners, as they are rightly called by the Cornish, were mostly fishermen, golfers and artists. My own father, in his leisure from business in London, was all three. The attraction of Cornish scenery for artists started with the picturesque movement at the end of the 18th century. Thomas Rowlandson used to stay with the Onslows at Hengar in St. Tudy Parish, 
and sketch the wooded valleys of North Cornwall, the tors on Bodmin Moor, the churches, farms and cliffs. He set a fashion which other English watercolour artists and engravers followed, notably Thomas Daniel. In the 1820s, Turner found inspiration in the south coast of the duchy. By the 1880s, artists were coming from England into Cornwall and settling in St Ives and Newlyn, and painting not only the scenery, but the people. Some, like Stanhope Forbes, made the journey via Brittany. The first whirls of the silvery mist of the Celtic revival had risen at Tintagel with Tennyson's Idylls of the King. The Cornish Celtic revivalists, poetical and artistic, took an interest in the old Cornish language, which was akin to Breton and Welsh, and had died out in the 18th century, and in the legends of the Celtic saints. The poet Hawker sang of the saints in Morwenstow, and the indefatigable Baring Gould told, and sometimes invented, picturesque legends about Celtic saints, later to be corrected by the learned Celtic hagiographer Canon Doble. The revival of the Sea of Cornwall and the building of the cathedral in Truro in the 80s turned the gaze of Christians to Brittany, where the feasts of so many Cornish saints were still kept. The romantic view of the Cornish and Cornwall has continued until the present day. The accomplished work of the Victorian artists of the Newlyn and St Ives schools is just being appreciated again after nearly half a century's neglect. Stanhope Forbes paintings show the Londoner's delight in the simple life, fisher folk, and the stony Celtic cottages and fields. From the 18th century Opie to Peter Lanyon in the present, there have, of course, been noted native artists. The Cornish themselves are not dreamy and unpractical, as the foreigners sometimes suppose. Like most Celts, they combine a deep sense of religion with a shrewd gift for business. These Iron Age people, who were Christian before the Saxons, had, until they were discovered by the tourists in the last century, a hard struggle for existence. The Saxons and the Normans tried to hold them down with forts and castles. They did not take kindly to the Reformation, nor to Cromwell, and most of them stood out for King Charles. They gained their living, since Roman times, by mining, for the minerals of Cornwall are numerous and rich, and he who buys land there likes to buy the mining rights too. They were also farmers, and fishermen. Their religious faith was awakened in the 18th century by John Wesley, and to this day the majority of the Cornish are Methodists. They had their own brand of it in the Bible Christians, a sect whose chief light was Billy Bray, the converted tin miner. Many an oil-lit chapel rang with alleluias on a Sunday, and hearts were lifted at the thought of a glorious day coming in the next life after years of ill-paid toil in the hot labyrinths of the mines. Their practical gifts came out in the invention of machinery for pumping water out of the mines and the use of steam power. They were boat builders, craftsmen and engineers, rather than architects. For this reason, the buildings of Cornwall are mostly homely and not at all grand. Only a Cornishman would have the endurance to carve intractable granite as he has done at St Mary Magdalene, Launceston, and Probus Tower. The awakening of the Cornish to the value of the tourist industry came with the railways. The Great Western extended itself into Cornwall and was thought of first in terms of goods traffic, tin, china clay and fish. The London and South Western, the Great Western's rival, ran a line into North Cornwall via Oakhampton, largely for holiday traffic. Fathers who had come for the fishing, and mothers who wanted sea air for their families at cheaper rates and in less plebeian conditions than those provided in Thanet or Brighton came to Cornwall. Monster hotels were built at the beginning of this century to provide for them, such as the King Arthur's Castle at Tintagel, the Paul Du at Mullion, and the Metropole at Padstow. Many a terrace of boarding houses arose in seaports which had hitherto thought that their only industry was to be fishing. Newquay and Bude are largely foreigners' creations, and Falmouth, turning the corner westward of Pendennis Castle, 
built a new seaside town. Simultaneously with the big hotel came the early 20th century cult of the old cottage in the country and picturesque ports like Polpero, St Ives, Lou and Foy did well. Farmers' wives specialised in Cornish teas and fishermen rowed the foreigners out of the harbour to catch mackerel they would otherwise be catching themselves. Farmers on the seacoast started growing bungalows instead of wheat. All this tourist industry brought prosperity and security to Cornwall until the appearance of the duchy was seriously altered by electricity and the motor car. The electricity board has strung the fields, villages and towns of Cornwall with more poles and wires, ill-sighted and clumsily arranged than in any other part of the British Isles. This is partly because even the remotest bungalow on a cliff wants electricity and partly because burying cables in slate or granite is expensive. The motor car has made the greatest change of all. Roads have been widened, blocks of houses have been taken down in picturesque ports to make way for car parks. Petrol stations proliferate. Huge hoardings to attract the motorists line the entrances to towns. In the holiday season, lorries and cars trailing caravans and boats block lanes never intended for such heavy traffic. The county planning authorities, hard put to it to find available sites on the coast, have been obliged to introduce caravans and chalets even to the wooded inland valleys. Several stretches of the coast have been rescued by the National Trust, or saved, at any rate for their lifetime, by those landowners who can still afford to hold out against the blandishment of developers. The old and beautiful Cornwall is now mostly to be found on foot or in a small car by those skilled in using the one-inch Ordnance Survey map. It is a consolation that no one yet has discovered how to build houses on the sea. Delectable Duchy Where yonder villa hogs the sea was open cliff to you and me. The many-coloured carrers fill the salty marsh to Schiller Mill, and foreground to the hanging wood are toilets where the cattle stood. The mint and meadows sweet would scent the brambly lane by which we went. Now, as we near the ocean roar, a smell of deep fry haunts the shore. In pools beyond the reach of tides, the senior service carton glides, and on the sand the surf line lisps with wrappings of potato crisps. The breakers bring with merry noise tribute of broken plastic toys and lichen spears of blackthorn glitter with harvest of the August litter. Here in the late October light, see Cornwall, a pathetic sight, rattled and put upon and tired and looking somewhat over-hired, remembering in the autumn air the years when she was young and fair those golden and unpeopled bays, the shadowy cliffs and sheep-worn ways, the white unpopulated surf, the thyme and mushroom-scented turf, the slate-hung farms, the oil-lit chapels, thin elms and lemon-coloured apples, going and gone beyond recall, now she is free for one and all. One day, a tidal wave will break before the breakfasters awake, and sweep the carrers out to sea, the oil, the tar, and you and me, and leave in windy criss-cross motion a waste of undulating ocean with, jutting out, a second silly, the isles of Rotor and Brown Willy. St. Caddock a flame of rushlight in the cell, on holy walls and holy well, and to the west the thundering bay, with soaking seaweed, sand and spray. O oh, good St. Caddock, pray for me, here in your cell beside the sea. Somewhere the tree, the yellowing oak, is waiting for the woodman's stroke, waits for the chisel, saw and plane to prime it for the earth again, and in the earth, for me inside, the generous oak tree will have died. 
St. Caddock blessed the woods of ash, bent landwards by the western lash. He loved the veined threshold stones, where sun might sometime bleach his bones. He had no cowering fear of death, for breath of God was Caddock's breath. Some cavern generates the germs to send my body to the worms. Today some red hands make the shell to blow my soul away to hell. Today a pair walks newly married along the path where I'll be carried. St. Caddock, when the wind was high, saw angels in the Cornish sky as ocean rollers curled and poured their loud hosannas to the Lord. His little cell was not too small for that great Lord who made them all. Here, where St. Caddock sheltered God, the archaeologist has trod, yet death is now the gentle shore, with land upon the cliffs before, and in his cell beside the sea, the Celtic saint has prayed for me. End of Side 1A. Side 1B. Port Isaac. Can it really be that a town is half a mile away? I have walked between high Cornish hedges from St. Endelium, once the parish church of Port Isaac. The tower dwindles, land winds, the slate of the hedges is overgrown with grasses, bed straw, and milky pink convolvulus, pale purple scabious, and here and there, darker valerian. From several places, standing on a hedge or looking through a gate, I can glimpse the sea. The sea is there all right, the great Atlantic, emerald green, wrinkled, glittering, sliding streaks of water, spotted dark blue here and there with reflections. It was a full tide, tamed and quiet for the moment, sliding round this inhospitable coast of North Cornwall, with white crescents of surf floating close inshore. From here, on these high up fields, where Blackthorn is sliced by the sea wind and leans inland, I can see all along the rocky cliffs to Tintagel Head. Behind me is even grander coast to the Rumps Point and Pentire. Cliffs and ocean are fine to watch from these high, windy fields as cloud shadows race over them. But where can there be a town? Less than half a mile, and still no sight of it. There is no doubt this is the way to approach Port Isaac, from St. Endelium, on the Polseth side of the port. The final hill is very steep, and there is only a disused quarry in which you can park a motor car if you are not on foot. Not until you round a corner do you see any sign of Port Isaac at all. Then you see it all, huddled in a steep valley, a cover at the end of a coombe, roofs and roofs, tumbling down either steep hillside in a race for shelter from the southwest gales. A freshwater stream pours brown and cold along the valley, under slate bridges, between old houses, under the road, and out into the little harbour. Port Isaac is... Paul Perro without the self-consciousness, St. Ives without the artists, the same whitewashed slate houses with feathery-looking roofs which have been grouted. That is to say, the old slates have been cemented over and lime-washed, the same narrow airless passages between whitewashed walls. But here are winding paths that climb up steps of beautiful blue-green delibold slate to other winding paths. Hills, too steep for anyone with heart trouble to manage. Roads and lanes, too narrow for buses or coaches. One of the sights of Port Isaac used to be to watch the lifeboat being brought down 4th Street and missing the walls by inches as she was manoeuvred round the bend at the Golden Lion into the town plat. Port Isaac has no grand architecture. A simple slate Methodist chapel and Sunday school in the Georgian tradition hangs over the harbour and is the prettiest building in the town. On the opposite side of the water is a picturesque Gothic-style school, from whose pointed windows the teachers could, if they wished, pitch their pupils down the cliffside into the harbour below. Then, 
Lost in rambling cliff paths between the walls, some so narrow that a fat man could not use them, is my favourite house in Port Isaac. It is called the Bird Cage, an irregular pentagon in shape, one small room thick and three storeys high, and hung on the weather sides with slates which have gone a delicate silvery blue. It's empty now, and obviously condemned. For that is the sad thing about Port Isaac. It's the kind of place town planners hate, the quintessence of the quaint. There are no boulevards, no car stands or clinics. The dentist calls once a week and brings his instruments with him in his car. The community centre is all wrong by town planning standards. It is not the public house, but the liberal club. Anyone who knows Cornish fishermen must know that most of them do not drink. Many are chapel goers, and a liberal club without a license is the sort of place where you would expect to find them. The trade of Port Isaac really is fishing. The harbour does not draw much water. It hardly is a harbour. A better description would be an unexpected cove between high cliffs. Two arms have been built out into the water to keep back the bigger seas, while great guardian headlands keep the harbour calm in most weathers. It is used by small craft, and these are reached by dinghies drawn up on the town plat among lobster pots and nets. The promise of a dark night after a shoal of pilchards had been sighted, the sound of rollocks and splashing of oars in harbour water, boarding the fishing boat from the dinghy, the outside roar of the sea, the dark cliffs fading in twilight and dropping away as we move out to open sea, letting down the nets and drifting. Those were the times. Unless, like me, you were a shocking sailor, and sick all night and thanking God for the dawn light and the nearing cliffs of Varley Head as you made for home and harbour. Even if you are no sailor, the smell of fish tells you the chief business of the port. And your eyes will tell you too. For the little houses, the oldest of 16th century, though so huddled together and so steeply hung onto cliffs, are like all fishermen's houses, wonderfully clean and polished. Sparkling quartz, known as Cornish diamond, is cemented into garden walls. Figs and fuchsia bushes grow in tiny gardens. Big shells from the Orient rest on window sills. Brass and paint of front doors shine. Carpentry is excellent. And all windows that can look out to sea, so that even as they die, the old fishermen of Port Isaac may watch the tides. I expect the old people will all soon be moved to some very ugly council houses being built on the windy hilltop in those hideous grey cement things called Cornish blocks. Across stupendous cliffs, as full of flowers as a rock garden, is another little fishing port, Port Quinn, an empty Port Isaac, mournful and still. For here the old cottages are nearly all ruins. The harbour is deserted, the gardens once so trim are grown over with elder and ash saplings, honeysuckle and fennel. The salting sheds are in ruins too. The story is that the whole fishing fleet of the village went down in a gale, and thirty-two women were left widows. And beyond Port Quinn, what caves, what rocks, what shuddering heights of striped slate, what hidden beaches and barnacled boulders, what pools where seals bask there are between here and Pentar Point. All picturesque and grand, as blazing with colour as are the strange rock pools themselves on a summer day. The colours are brighter than the tropics. The veined rock in which the warm salt water lies is purple with white lines and then green, then purple again. Warm forests of red seaweed grow there, and green seaweed which looks like elm trees. If there is sand on the bottom of the pool, and the red weed waving, you may see a huge prawn gliding and shooting backwards, and the sudden dash of a small fish, too quick for the eye to see, more than the sudden cloud of sand it raises. 
Or the rock pool may be one with shells and shingle at the bottom, and perhaps those rose-tinted cowries, the pearls of this coast, and a huge starfish, magnified by the water in all its pink and grey and purple colouring. Never was such colour. Never is the wonder of God's creation more brought home to me than when I see the strange, merciless, bright-coloured world of these Cornish rock pools. But in a storm, or in a mist, how infinitely horrible and mysterious this coast can be, as the rollers smash and suck, the blowholes thunder, and caves siphon out fountains of sea water a hundred feet and more into the air. Tis harsh to hear from ledge or peak the cruel cormorant's tuneless shriek, fierce songs they chant in pool or cave, dark wanderers of the western wave. So wrote Hawker, the parson poet of Morwenstow, not many miles higher up the coast. He knew that the sea is an army fighting the land, as do the men of Port Isaac. But I like to stand in summer by the bit of wall in Fore Street and lean over to look down at the harbour and inland at the little town below me. It is evening, harvest festival time. The small Victorian church has been hung with lobster pots and dressed with crabs and seaweed, a harvest festival of the sea. Church is over, but chapel is still on. As I stand on this viewpoint above the town, the seagulls are crying and wheeling, the flowery cliffs take the evening sun, the silvery slates of the old town turn pale gold. Above the lap of the harbour water, the wail of gulls and thunder of the sea beyond the headlands, comes the final hymn from the Methodist chapel, across the green and gently rolling harbour flood. To Bethwick. We used to picnic where the thrift grew deep and tufted to the edge. We saw the yellow foam flakes drift in trembling sponges on the ledge below us till the wind would lift them up the cliff and o'er the hedge. Sand in the sandwiches, wasps in the tea, sun on our bathing dresses heavy with the wet, squelch of the bladder rack waiting for the sea, fleas round the tamarisk, an early cigarette. From where the Coast Guard houses stood, one used to see below the hill the lichened branches of a wood in summer silver cool and still. And there the shade of evil could stretch out at us from Schiller Mill. Thick with slow and blackberry, uneven in the light, lonely round the hedge, the heavy meadow was remote. The oldest part of Cornwall was the wood as black as night, and the pheasant and the rabbit lay torn open at the throat. But when a storm was at its height and feathery slate was black in rain and tamarisks were hung with light and golden sand was brown again, springtide and blizzard would unite and sea came flooding up the lane. Waves full of treasure then were roaring up the beach, ropes round our mackintoshes, waders warm and dry. We waited for the wreckage to come swirling into reach, Rafe, Vasey, Alistair, Biddy, John and I. Then roller into roller curled and thundered down the rocky bay, and we were in a water world of rain and blizzard, sea and spray, and one against the other hurled, we struggled round to Greenaway. Blessed be St. Enadoc, blessed be the wave, blessed be the springy turf, we pray, pray to thee. Ask for our children all the happy days you gave to Rafe, Vasey, Alistair, Biddy, John and me. Tregardoc. A mist that from the moor arose in sea fog wraps Port Isaac Bay. The moan of warning from Travaux makes grimmer this October day. Only the shore and cliffs are clear, gigantic slithering shelves of slate in waiting awfulness appear like journalism full of hate. On the steep path a bramble leaf stands motionless and wet with dew. The grass bends down, the bracken's brown, 
the grey-green gorse alone is new. Cautious, my sliding footsteps go to quarried rock and dripping cave. The ocean, leaden still below, hardly has strength to lift a wave. I watch it crisp into its height and flap exhausted on the beach, the long surf menacing and white, hissing as far as it can reach. The dunmin do not move, each bird is stationary on the sand, as if a spirit in it heard the final end of sea and land. And I, on my volcano edge, exposed to ridicule and hate, still do not dare to leap the ledge and smash to pieces on the slate. Saint Endelian. Saint Endelian, Saint Endelian. The name is like a ring of bells. I travelled late one summer evening to Cornwall in a motor car. The road was growing familiar. Delabole with its slate quarry passed, then Pendoggart. Gateways in the high fern stuffed hedges showed sudden glimpses of the sea. Port Isaac Bay with its sweep of shadowy cliffs stretched all along to Tintagel. The wrinkled Atlantic Ocean had the evening light upon it. The stone and granite manor house of Tresungas, with its tower and battlements, was tucked away out of the wind on the slope of a valley, and there, on the top of the hill, was the old church of St. Endelion. It looked, and still looks, just like a hair. The ears are the pinnacles of the tower, and the rest of the hair, the church, crouches among wind-slashed firs. On that evening, the light bells with their sweet tone were being rung for practice. There's a ringer's rhyme in the tower, painted on a board. It shows Georgian ringers in knee breeches, and underneath is written a rhyme which ends with these fine four lines. Let's all in love and friendship hither come, whilst the shrill treble calls to thundering Tom, and since bells are for modest recreation, let's rise and ring and fall to admiration. They were ringing rounds on all six bells. But as we drew near the tower, a grand granite 15th century tower looking across half Cornwall, as we climbed the hill, the bells sounded louder even than the car. Saint Endelion, Saint Endelion, they seemed to say, Saint Endelion. Their music was scattered from the rough lichen openings over foxgloves, over grey slate roofs, lonely farms, and feathery tamarisks, down to that cluster of whitewashed houses known as Tree Lights, the only village in the parish, and to Ross Carrack, and Trehavrock, and Trefriock. Heard perhaps, if the wind was right, where lanes run steep and narrow to that ruined, forgotten fishing place of Port Quinn, St. Endelion. It was a welcome to Cornwall, and in front of us the sun was setting over Gulland, and making the Atlantic at Polzeth and Pentire glow like a copper shield. Ora pro nobis sancta endelienta. The words are carved in strangely effective lettering on two of the new oak benches in the church. Incidentally, those carved benches, which incorporate some of the old Tudor ones, are very decent looking for modern pews. They were designed by the present rector and carved by a local sculptress. But who was Saint Endelion? She was a 6th century Celtic saint, daughter of a Welsh king, who with her sisters Minva and Teeth and many other holy relations came to North Cornwall with the gospel. There was an Elizabethan writer who lived in the parish, Nicholas Ross Carrick. He loved the old religion, and was imprisoned in the tower and put on the rack, and then imprisoned again. He wrote the life of his parish saint, Saint Endelient, he called her, and said she lived only on the milk of a cow. Which cow the Lord of Trentenny killed as she strayed into his grounds, and as old people speaking by tradition do report, she had a great man to her godfather, which they also say was King Arthur, 
who took the killing of the cow in such sort as he killed or caused the man to be slain, whom she miraculously revived. Nicholas Ross Carrick also wrote a hymn in her praise. To imitate in part thy virtues rare, thy faith, hope, charity, thy humble mind, thy chasteness, meekness, and thy diet spare, and that which in this world is hard to find, the love which thou to enemy didst show, reviving him who sought thy overthrow. When she was dying, Endeliant asked her friends to lay her dead body on a sledge and to bury her where certain young Scots bullocks or calves of a year old should, of their own accord, draw her. This they did, and the Scots bullocks drew the body up to the windy hilltop where the church now stands. The churchyard is a forest of upright, delibole slate headstones, a rich grey-blue stone inscribed with epitaphs. The art of engraving lettering on slate continued in this district into the present century. Names and rhymes set out on the stone spaciously, letters delicate and beautiful. From the outside, it's the usual Cornish church, a long, low building of elven stone, most of it built in Tudor times. But the tower is extra special. It is of huge blocks of granite, brought, they say, from Lundy Island. The ground stage of the tower is strongly moulded, but the builders seem to have grown tired and to have taken less trouble with the detail higher up, though the blocks of granite are still enormous. I can remember Endelian before its present restoration. There's a photograph of what it used to look like in the porch. Pitch pine pews, pitch pine pulpit, swamping with their yellow shine the clustered granite columns of the aisles. Be careful as you open the door not to fall over. Three steps down, and there it is. Long and wide and light and simple, with no pitch pine anywhere except a lectern. A nave and two aisles with barrel roofs carved with bosses. Some of them old, but most of them done twelve years ago by a local joiner the village postman and the sculptress. The floor is slate. The walls are stone, lightly plastered bluish-grey. There is no stained glass. Old oak and new oak benches, strong and firm and simple, fill but do not crowd the church. They do not hide the full length of these granite columns. The high altar is long and vast. At the end of the south aisle is the sculptured base of St. Endelienta's shrine, in a blue-black slate called Cataclus, a boxwood among stones. The church reveals itself at once. Though at first glance it is unmysterious, its mystery grows. It is the mystery of satisfying proportion. And no, not just that, nor yet the feeling of age, for the present church is almost wholly early Tudor, not very old as churches go, nor is the loving use of local materials all to do with it. Why does Saint Endelion seem to go on praying when there is no one in it? The blessed sacrament is not reserved here, yet the building is alive. There is something strange and exalting about this windy Cornish hilltop looking over miles of distant cliffs that cannot be put into words. Down a path from the north door, bordered with fuchsias, is the rectory. The rector of St. Endelion is also a prebendary. This church is run by a college of priests, like St. George's Chapel, Windsor. There are four prebends in the college, though their building is gone and they live elsewhere. They are the prebends of Marnie, Trehavrock, Endelion, and Bodmin. Each of the prebendal stalls has a little income attached to it and is held by local priests. The money is given to Christian causes. For instance, the parish of Port Isaac, formed out of St. Endelion in 1913, is financed with the income of the Bodmin prebendary. How this 
heavenly medieval arrangement of a college of prebendary clergymen survived the Reformation and Commonwealth and Victorian interferers is another mystery of St. Endelian for which we must thank God. It was certainly saved from extinction by the late Athelstan Riley and Lord Clifton. Episcopal attacks have been made on it, but long live St. Endelian. Trehavrock, Marnie and Bodmin, hold fast. Sancta Endelienta Ora Pro Nobis. I take a last look at St. Endelian, standing on a clifftop of this Atlantic coast. The sun turns the water into moving green. In November weather, if the day is bright, the cliffs here are in shadow. The sun cannot rise high enough to strike them. The bracken is dead and brown, the grassy cliff tops vivid green, red berries glow in bushes. Ice cream cartons and cigarette packets left by summer visitors have been blown into crevices and soaked to pulp. The visitors are there for a season. Man's life on earth will last for 70 years, perhaps. But this sea will go on swirling against these green and purple rocks for centuries. Long after we are dead, it will rush up in waterfalls of whiteness that seem to hang halfway up the cliff face and then come pouring down with tons of ginger beery foam. Yet, compared with the age of these rocks, the sea's life is nothing. And even the age of rocks is nothing compared with the eternal life of man. And up there on the hill, in St. Endelian Church, eternal man comes week by week in the Eucharist. That is the supreme mystery of all the mysteries of St. Endelion. Sunday afternoon service in St. Enadoc Church, Cornwall. Come on, come on. This hillock hides the spire, now that one, and now none, as winds about the burnished path through ladies' finger, time, and bright varieties of saxifrage, so grows the tinny tenor, faint or loud, and all things draw towards St. Enadoc. Come on, come on, and it is five to three. Paths unfamiliar to golfers' brogues, cross the 11th fairway broadside on and leave the 14th tee for 13th green, ignoring royal and ancient, bound for God. Come on, come on. No longer bare of foot, the soul grows hot in London shoes again. Jack Lamborn in his Sunday navy blue wears tie and collar, all from Selfridges. There's Enid with a silly parasol, and Graham in grey flannel with a crease across the middle of his coat, which lay pressed neath the box of his Meccano set, Sunday to Sunday. Still, come on, come on, the tinny tenor. Hoverflies remain more than a moment on a ragwort bunch, and people's passing shadows don't disturb red admirals basking with their wings apart. A mile of sunny, empty sand away, a mile of shallow pools and lugworm casts, safe, faint and surfy, laps the lowest tide. Even the villas have a Sunday look. The ransom mowers locked into the shed. I have a splitting headache from the sun. And bedroom windows flutter cheerful chintz where double aspirin a mother sleeps, while father in the loggia reads a book, large, desultory, birthday present size, published with coloured plates by Country Life, a Bernard Darwin on the English links, or Braid and Taylor on the mashy shot. Come on, come on, he thinks of Monday's round. Come on, come on, that interlocking grip. Come on, come on, he drops into a doze. Come on, come on, more far and far away the children climb a final stile to church. Electoral roll still flapping in the porch. Then the cool silence of St. Enadoc. My eyes, recovering in the sudden shade, discern the long-known little things within. A map of France in damp above my pew. Grey-blue of granite in the small arcade. Late perp, and not a Parker specimen, but roughly hewn on windy Bodmin Moor. The modest windows palely glazed with green, the smooth slate floor, the rounded wooden roof, 
the Norman arch, the cable-moulded font, all have a humble and West Country look. Oh, drastic restoration of the guide. Oh, three-light window by a Plymouth firm, absurd truncated screen, oh, sticky pews, embroidered altar cloth, untended lamps, so soaked in worship you are loved too well for that dispassionate and critic stare that I would use beyond the parish bounds, biking in high-banked lanes from tower to tower on sunny antiquarian afternoons. Come on, come on, a final pull. Tom Blake stalks over from the bell rope to his pew, just as he slopes about the windy cliffs, looking for wreckage in a likely tide, nor gives the holy table glance or nod. A rattle as red bays is drawn aside. Miss Rhoda Pulden pulls the tremolo, the oboe, flute and vox humana stops. A village voluntary fills the air and ceases suddenly as it began, save for one oboe faintly humming on. As slow the weary clergyman subsides, tired with his bike ride from the parish church. He runs his hands once, twice across his face. Dearly beloved. And a bumblebee zooms itself free into the churchyard sun, and so my thoughts this happy Sabbath tide. Where deep cliffs loom enormous, where cascade, mesembryanthemum, and stone crop down, where the gull looks no larger than a lark hung midway twixt the cliff top and the sand, sun shadowed valleys roll along the sea. Forced by the backwash, see the nearest wave rise to a wall of huge translucent green and crumble into spray along the top, blown seaward by the land breeze. Now she breaks and in an arch of thunder plunges down to burst and tumble, foam on top of foam, crisscrossing, baffled, sucked and shot again, a waterfall of whiteness down a rock without a source but rollers furthest reach, and tufts of sea pink high and dry for years are flooded out of ledges, boulders seem no bigger than a pebble washed about in this tremendous tide. O oh, kindly slate, to give me shelter in this crevice dry. These shivering stalks of bent grass, lucky plant, have better chance than I to last the storm. O oh, kindly slate of these unaltered cliffs, firm, barren substrate of our windy fields. O oh, lichen slate in walls, they knew your worth who raised you up to make this house of God. What faith was his, that dim, that Cornish saint, small rushlight of a long-forgotten church, who lived with God on this unfriendly shore, who knew he made the Atlantic and the stones, and destined seamen here to end their lives, dashed on a rock, rolled over in the surf, and not one hair forgotten. Now they lie in centuries of sand beside the church. Less pitiable are they than the corpse of a large golfer, only four weeks dead, this sunlit and sea-distant afternoon. Praise ye the Lord! and in another key, the Lord's name by harmonium be praised. The second evening and the fourteenth psalm. Blisland Church crawling is the richest of pleasures. It leads you to the remotest and quietest country. It introduces you to the history of England in stone and wood and glass which is always truer than what you read in books. It was through looking at churches that I came to believe in the reason why churches were built and why, despite neglect and contempt, innovation and business bishops, they still survive and continue to grow and prosper, especially in our industrial towns. Of all the country churches of the West I have seen, I think the church of St. Protus and St. Hyacinth, Blisland in Cornwall, is the most beautiful. I was a boy when I first saw it, thirty or more years ago. I shall never forget that first visit, bicycling to the inland and unvisited parts of Cornwall from my home by the sea. The trees at home were few and thin, sliced and leaning away from the fierce Atlantic gales. The walls of the high Cornish hedges were made of slate, stuffed in between with fern and stone crop and the pulpy green triangles of mesembryanthemum, 
sea vegetation of a windy seacoast country. On a morning after a storm, blown yellow spume from Atlantic rollers would be trembling in the wind on inland fields. Then, as huge hill followed huge hill, and I sweated as I pushed my bicycle up, and heart in mouth went swirling down into the next valley, the hedges became higher, the lanes ran down ravines, the plants seemed lusher, the thin Cornish elms seemed bigger, and the slate houses and slate hedges gave place to granite ones. I was on the edge of Bodmin Moor, that sweet brown home of Celtic saints, that haunted, thrilling land so full of ghosts of ancient peoples whose hut circles, beehive dwellings and burial mounds jut out above the ling and heather. Great wooded valleys, white below the trees with wood anemones or blue with bluebells, form a border fence on this, the western side of Bodmin Moor. Perched on the hill above the woods stands Blisland village. It has not one ugly building in it, and, which is unusual in Cornwall, the houses are round a green. Between the lichen-crusted trunks of elm and ash that grow on the green, you can see everywhere the beautiful moorland granite. It is used for windows, for chimney stacks, for walls. One old house has gable ends carved in it. They are 16th or 17th century and curl round like Swiss rolls. The church is down a steep slope of graveyard, past slate headstones, and it looks over the treetops of a deep and elmy valley and away to the west where, like a silver shield, the Atlantic shines. An opening in the churchyard circle shows a fuchsia hedge and the vicarage front door beyond. The tower is square and weathered and made of enormous blocks of this moorland granite, each block as big as a chest of drawers. When I first saw it, the tower was stuffed with moss and with plants which had rested here and there between the great stones. But lately, it has been most vilely repointed in hard, straight lines with cement. The church itself, which seems to lean this way and that, throws out chapels and aisles in all directions. It hangs on the hillside, spotted with lichens, which have even softened the slates of its roof. Granite forms the tracery of its windows. There is a granite holy water stoop in the porch. The whitewashed porch, the flapping notices, the door. That first thrill of turning the handle of the door of a church never seen before, or a church dearly loved and visited again and again like Blisland. Who but the confirmed church crawler knows it? Sir Ninian Compa, that great church architect, says that a church should bring you to your knees when first you enter it. Such a church is Blizzland. For there before me, as I open the door, is the blue-grey granite arcade, the hardest of stones to carve. One column slopes outwards, as though it was going to tumble down the hill, and a carved wooden beam is fixed between it and the south wall to stop it falling. The floor is a blue slate and pale stone. Old carved benches of dark oak and a few chairs of a seating. The walls are white, the sun streams in through a clear west window, and there, glory of glories, right across the whole eastern end of the church, is a richly painted screen and rude loft. It is of wood. The panels at its base are red and green. Wooden columns, highly coloured and twisted like barley sugar, burst into gilded tracery and fountain out to hold a panelled loft. There are steps to reach this loft in the wall. Our Lord and his mother and St John, who form the rood, are over the centre of the screen. I look up, and there is the old Cornish roof shaped like the inside of an upturned ship, all its ribs richly carved, the carving shown up by white plaster panels. Old roofs, beautifully restored, are to be seen throughout the church. They stretch away beyond the cross irregularly and down the aisles. I venture in a little further. There, 
Through this rich screen I mark the blazing gold of the altars and the medieval style glass, some of the earliest work of Mr. Comper. In the nave is a pulpit shaped like a wine glass, in the Georgian style and encrusted with cherubs and fruit carved in wood. The screen, the glory of the church, the golden altars, the stained glass and the pulpit are comparatively new, designed by F. C. Eden in 1897, who died a few years ago. He must have visualised this Cornish church as it was in medieval times. He did not do all the medieval things he might have done. He did not paint the walls with pictures of angels, saints and devils. He left the western windows clear that people might see their books. He put in a Georgian pulpit. He centred everything on the altar to which the screen is, as it were, a golden red and green veil to the holiest mystery behind it. What do dates and style matter in Blisland Church? There is Norman work in it, and there is 15th and 16th century work, and there is sensitive and beautiful modern work. But chiefly, it is a living church whose beauty makes you gasp, whose silent peace brings you to your knees, even if you kneel on the hard stone and slate of the floor, worn smooth by generations of worshippers. The valley below the church was hot, and warm when first I saw this granite, cool interior. Valerian sprouted on the vicarage wall. A fig tree traced its leaves against a western window. Grasshoppers and birds chirruped. St Protus and St Hyacinth, patron saints of Blisland Church, pray for me. Often, in a bus or train, I call to mind your lovely church. The stillness of that Cornish valley and the first really beautiful work of man which my boyhood vividly remembers. End of Side 1B